Welcome to This Is His Story podcast. Ministries and God's stories you need to know. Welcome to This Is His Story podcast. We're here today with Thomas Carlson, CEO and Executive Director of eCatalyst. And today we're going to learn about what makes Thomas passionate about transforming communities through entrepreneurship. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. It's great to be here. All right, brother. Well, before we get into what you do, I want to know who you are. So (laughs) if you could back up young age, wherever you want to start, but tell us a little bit about where you went to school, how you grew up, what formed you, who was involved in your, in your world, whether that's a teacher, parent, brother, sister, whatever. Just tell me a little bit about your formative years. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I grew up in Georgia, in Athens, Georgia, actually. So I'm a lifelong UGA fan, which is finally paying off after 40 years of (laughs) of pain and heartache. Uh, And uh, I grew up in sort of this moderate Episcopal church and came to the Lord actually through a guy that that was an eighth grade Sunday school teacher uh, that was just an amazing guy, a guy named Lou Nix. And, uh, and Lou discipled me all the way through high school. And it really just changed my life. It, 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 there was something about that, that made God and Jesus real in a way that I just never really seen it before. I'd always seen it through the eyes of religion. Uh, and then I really saw it through the eyes of relationship and that made all the difference in the world. And, um, I think it was also sometime in there that I started really feeling a call to work with the poor. What whatever that meant. I, I, I really, I, I mean, in my teenage years, I had no idea, but I just had this kind of idea that I wanted to do missions or something, you know? Um, and I wound up, uh, going to, when I went to college, I went to, started out in a small school in Tennessee called Swanee University of the South, and then graduated from Cornell, uh, up in, uh, up in upstate New York. But my, uh, my junior summer, I went oh, the summer after my junior year, I went to Haiti for three months and I, I learned Creole. And I'm hanging out in this community four hours out of Port, Port-au-Prince. That's like, I was the only white person for two hours drive in any direction. Wow. Um, and so, I mean, it really was, it was just this crucible of cultural and learning and everything else. But there's, uh, I actually preached in Creole by the end of it, which was, which was amazing. Because, wow. well, I was just, I was immersed and it was a very easy language. I, okay. I can actually, I could teach you half of it, you know, here the next hour if you want <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wish, good luck teaching me a, a language in an hour, but okay. But the, the one conversation, I had this one conversation where it was a late afternoon. I was sitting with a couple of like older teenagers, 18, 19 years old. They're only a couple of years younger than I was. And, uh, and we were talking about, well, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, well, you know, I really feel like God's calling me to work with the poor. And they were like, great. What are you going to do? Yeah. And I realized I have no idea. I mean, I, I had this and I, and it just, that one question exposed so much of my arrogance going into this, that, Hmm. you know, is my being white and wealthy and American, not enough somehow, can I just show up and everything is just going to be better somehow. Um, And it just, it just stuck with me, this, this conviction that I've got to do, if I'm going to, if I'm going to work with the poor, whatever that means, I need to bring something that's a value to them. Um, Hmm. And I had no idea at the time what that meant. Um, but, you know, I graduated from college. I did some social work. I think I was still sort of searching for what this would look like. I went to seminary up at Gordon Conwell, graduated in 99, met my wife shortly thereafter, and we would spent 10 years in the Middle East. Wow. And, so, uh, so you knew it wasn't just, hey, I'm going to school to be an accountant, and then I want to work with the poor. You knew you wanted to be in ministry, and you were headed that away. I, it, it definitely was that I, I, I knew that that's where I wanted to go. Um, and I, you know, discovered really that, that working in the Middle East, because there's just so, so little of like Christian faith going on in the Middle East. And even those that do have faith tend to isolate and tend to be in very, very sort of secure bubbles, mm-hmm. um, that I really felt like I, this is part of what I wanted to do. So we, you know, we lived in a little Arab village in the Persian Gulf area, I uh, learned Arabic, uh, drank a ton of tea and, you know, ate lots right. and lots of rice and 
uh, sat out in the desert with these guys. And it was fantastic, fantastic stuff. But the other thing that that really did for me is I started doing business. And I realized, A, I'm actually pretty good at this. Um, I, I really liked business. I was a math major. I mean, I, you know, okay. I don't know where that came from, but yeah, you were, tra- you were trying to figure out where <laughs> math and ministry com- combined and you actually, yeah. you found your sweet spot. I found my sweet spot. I mean, well, it, was, it wasn't just the business itself. It was also that there's something about business that when it comes to doing ministry and t- having like real conversations with somebody, when you're talking about business, you're talking about life. You're mm-hmm. talking about anxiety. You're talking about fear. You're talking about success. You're talking about excitement. You're talking about ambition. You know, these are, Mm. these are core heart issues for people, you know? So when, when you're getting into business stuff, you're really getting into ministry just by default because you're talking about real stuff. Um, But also, and I, and this was part of what I was really struggling with is that I'm I'm sitting here, I feel like I've got this call on my life to go to the poor, and I'm working with some of the wealthiest people in the world. I mean That's what I was gonna <laughs> ask you. Was you were you were not scratching the poor the poor itch, were you? It was like, not scratching the poor itch at all. But I mean it was scratching a lot of other itches. And I, you know, I love the cultural interaction and and you know, and just really getting into these Arab families. It was just I I love the whole process. Okay. Um but when we came back in 2015. God brought this back up to my memory of, you know, not just my memory, but just like a conviction that Mm -hmm. you said you wanted to work with the poor. God felt, I felt like God called me to do that. It's time. I said, dang, okay. I don't know what that that looks like. And it goes back, go back to that conversation in Haiti of, okay, so what do I do? And I realized this business thing that I've been working on now for 15 years, mm-hmm. this changes things. I actually have something that I can bring. And it's, you know, it's about ownership. One thing I really felt convicted about is that, you know, charity in some ways really doesn't work. And I and I and I know there's a lot of people out there probably listening to this even that that struggle that you know, give money to charities. And I, and I don't want to, I know the intention is always a good thing, but there's mm-hmm. something about it that can be really destructive because um, a, it creates dependency. You know, when, you know, if your house burns down, you need stuff, you, right. you, you got to have stuff right away. That relief right. is essential. You have to do that when there's an earthquake, when there's a t- tsunami, you know, We've got to get relief out there. But if that relief is still there two years later, then people are beginning to thrive on money that's being given to them without them having to contribute materially or constructively to their own society. And that creates dependency. And nobody sets out to be dependent. It's not that these people are being dependent. I mean, you and I, if somebody gave you $10,000 a month and you didn't have to work anymore, you wouldn't, right. You know, you would, there's just no reason to do it. Uh, And as long as they're continuing to give you that money and there's a foreseeable future in that, to some extent, you would, you'd you'd Uh, just stop working. You know, this is a universal truth, meaning I know we say don't feed the bears, right. At at a park, because then they're, it, it, messes with their natural hunting and gathering exactly. right yep. and yep. so I, i'm assuming it's true in all cultures from america africa like you're seeing this everywhere if you give not only in the tr- crisis like yep. like you say when there's yep. a crisis of course you go help somebody absolutely but absolutely we, but you're just saying that all across the, the world we see that when people are given something it removes their desire to work for it. And if they know they're going to get it, they just rest in that. Right. And that yeah. would happen for you and me. It would happen yeah. for anybody. It's not, yeah. we we can't get this idea that, well, Africans would do this. No, they wouldn't. You, you and I would you do I it. Would I do mean, it. It, it just, it's, it's a natural response to being given something that, that allows you not to have to put effort or time or pain mm-hmm. into trying to create something else. But mm-hmm. when, when somebody does create something, when we when we inspire that that creative potential that God's given to us mm-hmm. to actually build something, and then those who can support us help us do that, it not only feeds us, <laughs> it not only takes care of us, it also 
it's something that we desire. We, we, we feel ownership because that, I think that ownership is part of what I think is our Imago Dei. It's that, that image of God, that when God created the world, he said, this is good. Mm -hmm. When we create something we feel that creation, we feel that power of that. There's something just good about that. And when we do that in developing countries and they create, they will keep it going. That's how you create sustainability. As long as we're pouring money in, we're not creating sustainability. Sustainability is one of those words that just gets tossed around everywhere just because we've done a a church or a a medical center or something else. Sustainability comes when we don't have to pour money in next year. Right. Right. It's the Vegas word. People the answer is, okay, let's say you're working on sustainability. Like you say, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a carrot that moves and no one ever catches it. It's like, oh, we're sustainable. What does that mean? Does that mean 1%, 50%, 100? Right. Is, it ever, is it will it ever be 100? And right. people spend tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in the sustainability that never reproduces that hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. right? It never it, actually becomes sustain, sustain, self-sustaining, which is yeah. what sustainability in some ways really ought to mean, at least in my mind. Anyway. No, to- totally so. agree. Okay. So let so let, let me make sure I'm, I'm getting this right. So two things that you really were seeing one as you were, as you wanted to help people, you were seeing, wow, I guess I could help the poor. And the fact I could, assist them in their time of need but right. so because because of what you were learning in the middle east you started thinking wait a minute if i can help pour into people and their jobs or mm-hmm. their um what was the word i'm looking for business like, yeah their businesses or or, or mm-hmm. them as entrepreneurs you're killing right. two birds with one stone and right. so this idea and this passion collide. Absolutely. So what did you do about it? Like, so that's a big thought. That doesn't mean <laughs> anything happened. You can just be driving in your car and say, oh, I have a great idea. But executing that idea is yes. a whole other deal. So tell me about that. Yeah, because there, there are a lot of people that are out there trying to do entrepreneurship. And and I think all entrepreneurial activity, to some extent or another, is a good thing. But I think there are better ways to do it and worse ways to do it, too. Uh, I think one of the things that I feel like is really important is that, you know, when we're going out to help the poor, what we need to do is come out underneath, not from top down, not coming mm-hmm. down over them and saying, oh, you poor pathetic people here, let us help you. Because that that communicates, even though we're feeding them, we're communicating a message that says you are incapable, you're incompetent, you don't have the ability to feed yourself. We'll feed you for we'll feed you for you. Yeah. And that's not empowering. You're not helping people stand up on their own. Right. But if we can come up from underneath and say, hey, you've got an idea and I believe in you. I want to support you building that idea. How can I help you? Now we're coming up underneath them and yeah. they're beginning to build something and then they love that thing and it keeps going because they're invested and they want to make it happen oh amen or i'm gonna i interviewed a lady actually ironically her moment her her epiphany moment was in haiti as well and she here she does so many things i'm not going to get into all the stuff she does but one thing she does is she goes to people who we i'm using the word christian american we we're quick to throw money at something right and and like that's going to solve it whatever that is and she comes to people and says, what do you need? And if they're like, I just need a ride to work. Yeah. I, I don't have a car. I just need a ride. Right. She'll give them the ride before uh-huh. she gives them money because they want to, they, to your point, no one yeah. wants to sit. We're not built to sit around. Right. And so she goes to people and says, do you need a suit to help you get a job? I'll give you a suit. So she gives people what they need for success. And that's right. sort of what you're saying. Not coming down like, oh, here's a hundred bucks and pat on the head. Right. It's empowering yep. people to perform the way they're we're wired to perform. And that yep. is the work and the entrepreneurial mindset, right? It's uh, I just want to make sure I'm saying that correct. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like the same thing, but you're doing it with business. Like it's a business plan. Right. And I think that's that's part of the key. I mean, I think when we're giving people things like food, like even clean water, which again. I don't want to knock anybody right. giving clean water. Clean water is important. Uh, but when we do it in a way that comes from us top down drilling a well for them, then they don't fix the well because it's not their well. They never owned it. You know, it wasn't, it never became theirs. 
But when we're even when we're doing these things, we're treating the symptoms of poverty. We're not treating poverty itself. We're not solving poverty. We're just treating the fact that when you're poor, you don't eat. Or when you're poor, you don't have clean water. Or when you're poor, you don't have power. These are all symptoms of poverty. They are not poverty themselves. And so trying to address poverty means addressing the economic realities that are on the ground that help you know, that that keep people from ever being able to feed themselves or being able to get water themselves. If you give people a job or if you help them start a business, now suddenly they can start taking care of themselves because they have the economic resources to be able to drive their own yeah. sustainability. All right, I love it. I'm probably asking a yeah. question that's 20 minutes in the future, but I'm going to go ahead and do it now. <laughs> Not everybody is built, just like you and me, we may have different mm-hmm. levels of entrepreneurship. Like one of my best friends, he would never start a business. He just needs his paycheck and sure, he just, sure, he, sure. he's comfortable. And then I'm more of a, I'm more of a risk taker. I'm more of an mm-hmm. entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you can't, I'm assuming you can't go to anybody and say, here, we're going to help you start a business. You're looking right. for people who are wired and are already hungry for that. Yes. Not forcing it on somebody. Absolutely. Okay. So how, yeah, do, you, and how no, do you do that? Well, okay. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's a really good point. Maybe to, before we get to how we do it, just okay. why we do that. Okay. Because I, I do know people who come in and say, okay, we're, we want to hire somebody to do this. And of course people need a job. So they, they'll, they'll raise their hand and they'll do it, but it's not really theirs. They didn't right. really create it themselves. So we do, I, I do believe that there are great ideas everywhere. You know, not everybody knows how to turn it into a business, and that's part of what they need help with. Not everybody has the support that they need, and that's also something you can help with. So not everybody has the capital that they need, and that's something we can help with. Mm -hmm. But the main thing I think people need is the hope, and Mm -hmm. the hope is that people in the developing world – the. I don't know if you've ever seen a graph of the missing middle, but the missing middle, we, we've got a video of this on our website, but it's the, the, in the developing developed world in the U S for instance, mm-hmm. we have more businesses on the lower end, but then gradually it sort of slopes downwards. And then it just creates this sort of this smooth slope all the way up to Jeff Bezos way down in the, you know, three blocks down the way. Uh-huh. Um, but there's a place in the middle there, that middle class that creates the economic churn that gives us an American dream. Mm-hmm. You can say, hey, if I work hard and I try this thing, you know, all other social issues aside, that I could actually build a business and, and a move chance. up in the yep. world, you know, yep. in the developed world, in the developing world, you have a huge hump at micro business. And then you have this sort of smaller hump up at the very top. And there's nothing in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it's that missing middle, that missing middle class, that means that people don't have the support and resources to be able to move up into a bigger business. They can start more micro business. They can start a really big business, those who are already up there and went to Harvard and came back and now they're starting their $200 million business. Mm -hmm. But the middle, it's that middle class that really isn't there. And that's part of what we need to be able to build because, and and, and this is actually, I'm, I'm getting off on a little bit of tangent here, but Part of what even our entrepreneurial efforts, you know, the West's entrepreneurial efforts, when we go in and try to help people with entrepreneurship, we usually either do it with micro business, which again is a good thing, but it doesn't really create economic development, or we do it by making big investments in companies that are already post revenue, which builds a bubble at the top. Right. We're not doing it in the middle. And that is where all of the economic activity happens in a developed country. And that's what they need too, is that economic activity in the middle that gives people an opportunity to move up into wealth. Okay. Well, I, I love it. I'm going to bring what I'm assuming is an aside, but if this somehow plays, let me know. So I, I have a, a buddy of mine and we were talking about how you move from lower lower class to middle class in, in the mm-hmm. States. And there yep. was, there's an organization that did this giant decade study. Mm-hmm. And they said, there is, you have like, I think it's like a 75% or 80% chance of moving from lower what, to middle class. And it was, mm-hmm. if you do three things, finish high school, mm-hmm. don't get married, don't get pregnant out of wedlock uh-huh. and have a job. Okay. Those three, that's it. Really? If yeah. you do those three things, you will jump to the, I mean, and statistically over decades of time, just right. work, right? get married first before you have a kid and, yep. and get a GED, finish high school. 
And yep. if you just do those three things, you will work yourself out. And so yep. I, I just wondered when, because I, I, I was with in Kenya the other day and me and a guy were talking and we were talking about, wow, it looks like there's a new middle class. Like there, like it, you know how, you know how it is in Africa. Yep. You don't know yep. way more than me. Like you're, it's yep. shack or condo. Right. But there was a lot of movement and, and restaurants that made me think, wow, this middle class is growing. It that, is growing. And so yep. Africa is a, I guess if we can talk about that in, in a minute too, but Africa seems to really be changing as people do what you're talking about. They yes. find that gap between the filthy rich uh-huh. and, the, and the super poor. Right. And as those start meeting, that's when you have this economic growth, right? Right. I just want to make sure right. I'm, I'm hearing you. No, 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 you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, no, I, I, I think there are some countries where that's really happening. I think Kenya is one of them. There's a, there's quite a bit of movement going on there. It's still developing, but it's right. developing farther than a lot of other places. The DRC would be a place where that's just not happening. Okay. Ethiopia is kind of in the middle right at the moment. Um, Rwanda. Rwanda it, they're sort of the super exa- poster child, right? Sort of, but the problem is with Rwanda is that a lot of the banking systems and everything is still keeping that middle missing a large part. So they've got a lot more stuff. They got a bigger bubble at the top. Okay. But a lot of their population is still very much at the bottom. So so again, it's 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 seeing the pathway. It's for somebody near the bottom or who, you know, comes out of college, because again, here you come out of high school and you can probably get a job. That's not always guaranteed in the developing world. Right. You know, you can come out of high school, you can be all prepared for a job, and there's just not any jobs available. Um, right. So what people need to be able to see is, okay, I've got an idea. I think this could work, but I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I mean, what, you know, where right. where am I going to go? Nobody's going to give me a loan. Nobody's going to give me anything else. If we can come to them and say, okay, listen, here's what you do. In three weeks, do this. In a month and a half, do this. In mm-hmm. six months, you do this. And then in a month, a year later, we'll help you do this. And then two years after that, we'll help you do this. And then they can start seeing the way that their business could start becoming a reality. And they can go, wow, okay, I'm going to do this. Yeah. And now it's still their business. They're still the ones owning it. They're creating, but they're creating it in a way that that has hope to actually grow. Yeah. And if you can create a whole community around that, then when one of those out of the community starts growing, everybody else looks at that and says, man, if he can do it, Pull I can up. do it too. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Okay. So, so your organization not only says we'll help you finance your goal, we'll literally help you business plan it. So that you know yes. what steps to take. So you're really offering both with the loan. Right, exactly. So what we're what we're trying to do is we're trying to create sort of a decentralized incubator. And what that does is we're looking at there's there's a lot of organizations that aim at high economic growth, some of the endeavors. I think FDI does a good bit of this. And there's a lot of organizations that aim at lots of people, you know, especially charities want to help as many people. Compassion is great at this. You know, they help tons and tons and tons of people and they get education to to them and they're, you know, they're giving money away, but they're not creating economic development. Mm. So what we're trying to do is figure out how do you do both? How do you create a large scale economic development that affects a large amount of the population and builds that middle class? And the way that we want to do this is through these sort of decentralized incubators. What we're going to do is create cohorts of entrepreneurs. So these are entrepreneurs working together on their businesses. They've got support with each other. They can ask questions of each other. They can start getting ideas. You know, if you, you're sitting in a room by yourself, you can come over 20 ideas. I can come over 20 ideas. But if the two of us get together, we can come up with 200 ideas. You know, there's, mm-hmm. we bounce ideas off of each other. And then, uh, and then if they get to a certain point where they can start pitching their idea, then they can pass into the next stage where they can start getting access to catalytic capital. And catalytic capital is that kind of money that gives you access to like an MVP or a market test. You know, you want to sell high-end peanuts, but you've never sold peanuts before. So let's buy you 40 kgs of peanuts and you package it into your little pot things and then go out and see if you can sell them in two weeks. Mm-hmm. If you can... Heck, let's get you another 40 kgs and, and let's get you 400 kgs, you know, but let's uh, let's do it small steps at a time so that you really know that you've got a market. You know how to do it. You can test it out after that first 40 kgs. You can come back. Well, you know, ask people, well, was it the label? What is it that motivated you to buy it, not buy it? These kind of things. 
You can start finding these things out that are going to make your business work. And so if we lead people up that direction, then at some point or another, those who pass to a point where they're really to, ready to make an angel pitch mm -hmm. can pass into the next stage, get mentoring and start actually getting them connected to angel investor networks and really start growing and scaling. So we'll capitalize this incubator through an incubator model, but do it decentralized at the beginning. So we're scattering the growth oriented ideas mm -hmm. on a much wider scale and giving access to that growth orientation to a much wider population of people. Mm -hmm. um, and then that incubator becomes locally owned right. so that we right. as an international 501c3 mm -hmm. are supporting them building not only their own businesses, but the business creating engine yeah. is also sustainable. Yeah, exactly right. Okay. So I guess my big question is, I'm, I'm assuming banks are your competition in different places because they rather loan, but of course their interest rates are crazy high and you're crazy going to high down. in some of the developing world yes yeah I mean, so you're so how do you make a decision of where you guys focus and then how do the people who need you find you like how is this working well that's that's a really good question we're about two years in right now one of the things that we've been doing i, I think i told you this before we started that you know we've been capitalizing and then doing some stuff and capitalizing and doing some stuff mm -hmm. we've gotten a lot done we've worked with over 300 entrepreneurs in rwanda another about 50 in ethiopia we've got uh several cohorts that are still going on but one of the things we're really beginning to develop we've done it we did a we did a test prototype online in India initially, and then these these like four different prototypes in Rwanda. What we want to do in, in Ethiopia now is actually build this model. And, right. uh, and the reason we're choosing Ethiopia, Ethiopia is, does have a civil war going on. It's not... It's very much in the very northern part of the country. It's not hap it's not affecting the most most of the country. But they've part of the reason that civil war is happening is because the former the people who used to control Ethiopia don't like the fact that there's a reformist government that's actually now in power right. uh, and they rebelled. And so there's this conflict and there's some stuff that's going on there that I don't even want to right. try to address right now. Cause I know people on both sides are struggling with this issue, but the reality is, is that the government really is trying to make reforms. And right. I think they're, they're beginning to change a lot of the policies. They've only been doing it for about four years now, since 2018. But the other thing that makes Ethiopia so cool is, A, they don't have a ton, ton of charity. Okay. Charity also destroys entrepreneurial mindsets. In Rwanda, we would actually have people sit in our cohort for three months and at the end say, okay, I've been in your chair for three months. Where's my money? Wow. And we were like, you that's not it. what we're here for. Yeah, we're not here to it. give you money. And But when you've been pouring money into a country for so long, that mindset becomes ingrained. Um, yeah. And it's just hard to get out of it. Um, and again, nobody set out to be dependent, but you do it for long enough. And that's what winds up happening. So yeah. Ethiopia has not experienced that. There is a scrappiness and a, and a hunger for creation in Ethiopia that I really love. And we've got a team there that is just top notch. Uh, we've got some entrepreneurs there that really want to see their country grow and uh, and I feel like we can build this entire program around them. Mm -hmm. So if we can get this started in Ethiopia, if we can capitalize, that's what we're really looking for right now is the capital to be able to make this happen in Ethiopia. Then once we've got that model together, now, then we want to go back to Rwanda. We've got Uganda on tap. We've got Lebanon, Egypt. There's several different places. I, of course, love the Arab world. I really want to get back up there, use my Arabic again. Um, but the but the point is, is we want to make sure that this model really does work. And I think it's got an enormous chance to do it. But that's what that's what we're trying to build in Ethiopia first. Okay, I, I love it. So I guess oh God, I've got so many questions. One of them <laughs> is um, the competition again, like, oh, yes, it's okay. hard to set that up in a country because once you get the people in the country like, wait, you're coming here. Mm -hmm. to give money to entrepreneurs and we'd rather hit them hard with our with ours like what makes you legal and not and them to allow you, us to come in if you will yeah i mean part of it is just tapping into the reality that a lot of people even even banks and we're working with a bank in rwanda right now we've we've struggled with them with the interest rates as well because 
They don't want to give a fair interest rate. And, and we're trying to say, you know, we want to work with you, no. but we want to help entrepreneurs more. We, and, right. you know, if you want to do that, work with us on that. And we figured out a couple of different ways we can do that. We've got a, we've got a, uh, another bank up in Ethiopia. At their core, people realize that building businesses is the way to develop their country. Right. Right. And anybody who has a much broader picture, including the banks, even though there's a self-interest there, realize that this really is the way to grow an economy and, and get off of charity. Nobody likes to be on charity. Uh -huh. uh, it's Again, we like to give it, but they, you know, ultimately, even though they're happy to take free money, I mean, who doesn't like free money, Right. but nobody loves to be on charity. Everybody wants to be able to be, do things on their own. So there is a real sense that people want that. So we, I, it's actually, it's not as hard as you think. It, it really is. There, there are people that are out there. And when we say what it is we're trying to do, there's a lot of people that rally to say, okay, we want to help you do that. Okay. You'd be surprised. Okay. All right. So I guess because of what I do for a living with, with, you know, fundraising, mm -hmm. I guess your business model as an, as a charitable organization, right. Mm -hmm. Is you're, you're, you don't really have investors. You have donors. The donors are investing into you to pull off the mission, but they're not getting a return on their money. They're, they're literally donating so that Actually, you can pull this off. Actually, that's not entirely true. There, there, we actually have two different pots of money that we're trying to raise right now. Okay. We're trying to raise $80,000 for Ethiopia. And okay. what we're going to do with Ethiopia is actually capitalize that like a for-profit business. And there's, it's going to be a loan. And okay. part of the reason we're going in as a loan for them, and we're going to pay off the loan to our investors too, mm -hmm. um, that is that we want them from the very beginning to say, revenue is essential. You have to build revenue. Mm -hmm. Um not just in the businesses you create, right. but even in the engine of those business creations, we need to build revenue from the beginning because that revenue not only will pay off the loan, it'll keep you going long after we're gone. That's so right. that's what we want to build in there right away. Okay. Uh, now it's concessionary capital. So it is what we're looking for. And this is part of what I, I really want to pitch to people out there who actually understand investment. When you do investments, you think about building value. That's why you do it. You're building value and it gives you return on your cash, particularly. Mm -hmm. but, but then we take our charity and we throw it into this black hole where we need to give more charity next year and more charity the year after that and more charity the year after that. Why not take those charitable dollars and use the same value system that you use with your investment dollars, mm -hmm. with your charitable dollars, but put it in that high risk space. This is These are startups. These are startups in the developing world. It's going to be risky and we may not get it back. I think we can, but we may not. And if we take that concessionary capital, that charitable capital and put it into that risk, uh, that risky space that can still build value. It may not be necessarily revenue value, but it can right. build impact value. If nothing else, right. even possibly get a return on your investment that's charitable money that's actually being used for sustainable purposes. And you know that because you'll get it back, you know, and that's right. part of what makes things exci exciting about that. But then we've also got the 501c3 that is going to be the support organization. It's going to be, we're basically right. doing a franchise model, but we're not franchising here. We're just franchising over there. Gotcha. So this 501c3, we do need to raise charitable capital for that. So we've got another 150 that we need to raise just for us. Um, in order to keep functioning and keep supporting them. So that's, the, it's those two pots. So you're at least half right as far as the, yeah. the, the, the charitable stuff goes. But we do have that, that vehicle for yeah. people who want to take their DAF money and put it into something that will actually pay them back. Yeah, no, I, love, I, I absolutely love that idea. Um, okay, so what you're doing is building a, a case study because in, two years, three years, five years, you'll be able to say this many percentages of businesses are making it and this much yep. loan payback. And you'll have a formula, but you don't know your formula numbers just yet. Exactly. Gotcha. And so you'll be able to prove, hey, this works or it's not working. It's almost working. And here's what we need to do to dial it in. 
And and there will be, I mean, this is this is part of what I tell entrepreneurs all the time is that, you know, failure is your biggest teacher. You know, it's going to be the thing that you learn the most from. And so I encourage my entrepreneurs is, you know, when you fail, throw a party and let's let's celebrate that because you just learned a ton, you know, and now you're going to be able to do it even better. We're coming at it from the same, you know, we got to take our own uh, our own advice here, you know, that. Yeah. We're going to get out there. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to cut our teeth on some of these things. And it's not all going to work exactly the way we want to, but we're going to learn and we're going to keep going. And we're determined to make sure that this really does happen. And so that's, that's part of, that's part of why proving the model right now, it's not just proving the model. It's even like refining and, and building that model in a way that we know it's going to work so yeah. that when we go to the next place, we've got something that we've already got the traction and the track record with to do. Yeah. And again, we've done this in Rwanda. We've done some other things. Yeah. So we've already done a lot of learning, but this would be the first time that we really use the model in its, in its entirety. Uh, and so, yeah, we'll, yeah. we got a lot to learn still. I, I, I love this. Okay. I think I asked this question 20 minutes ago. I'm going to re-ask. Okay. But now I know your model is not 100 set up yet, but you have some real world experience. How do these people find you, and how do you find them? Like that, because once again, you're. If I wanted you, I'd be so glad that I found you. But like, right. how, how in the world would I have known that e catalyst exists in my country? Yes. So I mean, what we do is we work through existing networks. The t- the two guys that are that are helping run that, but they've got two more guys that are on their team. But the the main two guys are both entrepreneurs. They've been in the entrepreneurial scene. They've been parts of a lot of the incubators. And so they have a finger on the pulse of a lot of what is going on in the entrepreneurial world in Ethiopia. And they've been able to just get the word out. Again, in some of these countries, in these developing countries, there are a lot of people who know the the ideas are there. And there's not the kind of support here. If here, you know, in the US, I want to start a business. There's, you know, there's the the Small Business Administration, uh, there's there's SCORE, there's half a dozen different entrepreneurial organizations here. I could go to any one of them and get the help that I need. Right. There, when somebody comes along and says, hey, we want to help entrepreneurs, they're like, really? <laughs> and, right. you know, the attraction, the attraction right. is powerful. So. Wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then your job is to, to vet. I guess, what here's what I was sitting here thinking, like, and I wonder, in 10 years from now, Yep. Well, you got, it's sort of like, let's say you started a new town, right? In the middle of nowhere, you know, you need the dry cleaners, you know, you need the bank, you know, whatever. I'm just wondering as you guys grow and get into different countries, even though you're willing to take ideas, you'll have some idea of what's successful. And sure. they're like, you know what, anybody who wants to invest in this, 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 we have a pretty good track record. Like that's, mm-hmm. those are going to work better. I just wonder if you're going to morph into suggesting or looking at for certain types of businesses because they succeed at a higher rate. Right. I I think I think I would still resist bringing our ideas in because a lot of times when we bring our own ideas in, they work. We we bring them in because we know them and love them in our economies. Right. It doesn't necessarily scratch the same itches that are that are over there. Yeah. When you see people who start their own business. Uh, over there, they're starting a business because they know the needs that they have. Mm-hmm. And I use my cultural ignorance about Ethiopia. I mean, I've been in 51 different countries. I've I've seen a lot of different cultures. I've interacted with a lot of different cultures, but I don't go in there as an expert. I, I in fact, I use my ignorance as part of my tool kit, yeah. as it were, because I go in and say, listen, I don't know Ethiopia. You know Ethiopia. Yeah. I can support you and help give you some tools to help entrepreneurs. I can help bring in some capital and make sure that we can help support them as they get growing. But how it's going to work here in Ethiopia, I don't know. Yeah. You do. Yeah. You need to be the one to do it. And then that empowers them. They feel like, oh, you really want me to be a leader. You're not just saying you want me to be a leader. Yeah. You actually want me to be a leader. And now I can be the support for my leader there and really give him the power to do what it is that needs to be done there. Yeah, no, totally love it. Do you have a, a, a forecast of like your caps, like different business models? Like one guy may need a million dollars to start up. And the other guy just needs 5,000. Yep. Like, do, you, do, you, do you know where your sweet spot is or where you're aiming? Well, what, what we're, we're going we're gonna to build up one way or the other. So we've sort of got a four-part pro- process. The first part is just ideation, and it's kind of the promotional thing. So like go to a big 
fill a banquet hall and just you know or a university stadium uh, auditorium or whatever and just do a day's worth of ideation let people think about ideas and businesses and nothing else um if they're going to get into the cohort they have to have an idea so they have to have a canvas filled out and at least have an idea of why what they're doing is a business and how they've got a customer then that next 10 weeks, they would be really working on validating that idea, going out, making sure that there really is a market, that they're, that their yeah. customers, you know, because most of us as entrepreneurs, well, <laughs> we have a tendency to have this thing called innovators bias, which is this idea that <laughs> everybody's going to want this new widget. Everybody, if I build it, they will come, you uh, know, it's. It's, We're gonna be beating people off of us to go to exactly, our doors exactly. and grab it. Who right. who wouldn't love this thing as much as I love it? And right. the reality is nobody is going to love the thing that you created as much as you did because you created it. You know, you're the one that built it. You put the time and the effort and the sacrifice. You made the thing. So of course you love it. And there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. But what you need to find out is what do the customers love? What do they really want? And will they pay so, that price for it? That, exactly. Not not the price you think they'll pay for it. Right, no. right, right, right. I, I I can't I can't base the price on my love for the product no. because again, my love is always going to be higher than anybody else's love wait um, well welcome to my world of uh, <laughs> nonprofits. it's the same thing every nonprofit's like if the world just knew what we were doing they'd want to give to us absolutely so they have that mentality that everybody wakes up with a hundred dollar bill burning a hole in their pocket right looking for somebody to give their money to it's like that's not the way the world works buddy <laughs> like we got to tell our story and you got to find your price point and figure out location 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 all right. the things right absolutely so you force them to not only assume, but to to work that through, work it yes. out, and come back to you with proof that no, I did sell yep. five thousand peanuts on that corner on a Saturday. I know I can do that in the future. Right, exactly. Okay. And 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 nonprofits are are hard in some ways too because the people that pay you are not the end users. Correct. They're not the ones that actually use the product. The product. My product is being used in Ethiopia, but my 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 customers are actually here. Mm -hmm. So it's really got to be more of an investment mindset mm -hmm. where I'm telling a compelling story that look at what it is we're able to create there. Look at the the sustainability and the capacity that's being built there. Would you support that happening? Mm -hmm. um, and that that's how the donations work. Investments are a little bit different because you could actually get a financial return on that. And we're offering that concessionary capital, which I think... I hope will appeal to to people who actually are investors, but uh -huh. it's, it's, it is a different, it's a slightly different thing, mm -hmm. but the same principle applies just because I love what eCatalyst does. And I've given up my career for it. I mean, this is, I put everything on the line for this. Nobody else is going to do that in right. the same way that I do. You could give me a hundred bucks, but that's not the same. I'm, I can't ask you to like give up your career in the same way that I've given up mine. You know, right. this yeah. is my passion. This is what I love, but I still got to find the thing that connects with you. You know, yeah, I, yeah, totally love that. Okay, one of my last questions for you on this is, um, once again, five years, ten years out, if every, yep. if this thing really just did everything you hoped it what would do. Besides growing into other locations, you, would you would it literally not need to be a nonprofit anymore? Like, what if you actually the investors were working? Then it becomes sustainable without donations at some point. Possibly, possibly. I, there, there's a chance for that. Part of the reason we decided to to make the the international organization, the 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 U.S. organization, nonprofit, is that I don't want to depend on Ethiopia to sustain us. Uh -huh. okay. And or Rwanda to sustain us. You know, uh -huh. it's possible that once we get to nine, 10 locations, that we might be getting just enough income that we could actually start sustaining ourselves as well. Uh -huh. But I don't want to take away from their sustainability by forcing them to sustain us. So right. that's why we decided to make it a nonprofit. If we hit a couple of unicorns and, you know, we get the next Amazon of Ethiopia, you know, uh -huh. up and going. It, it's entirely possible that that we could be sustained by the the businesses that we spin off, but I don't want to I don't want to go in with that expectation yeah. from Ethiopia that they would support us. T totally brilliant. Okay, so let, the way you worded that makes me have to ask a different question. And sure. That is, <laughs> it's not just I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth so you can correct me. I, I don't okay. I'm think I'm going to get this right. It's not just that you're quote unquote loaning 
a hundred thousand dollars out and hoping you get 110 back. Right. You own a part of the business that you're investing in. So yes. it's an internal residual income backwards. What percent, how does that work? What, what percentage they pay back? Sure. Sure. So when a business gets spun off and again, we're, we're trying this out We're we're, we're still experimenting, but right now we've settled on 7% that we would ask for any company that, uh, so once they get through the ideation and they cross that go, no go decision and they get into commercialization, now they have access to catalytic capital. Now they have access to the next sort of training uh, and, a, and a cohort of people that are all in that stage mm-hmm. that uh, we would ask them there and not to not for tuition, but for 7% of their, their company. One of the things that Ethiopia does do well, even though some of their monetary policy is not the greatest, mm-hmm. one of the things that they do do well is that they have a great share you know like um a corporate a corporate structure in the legal system so that you can easily take shares it can pay back in dividends now the vast again the vast majority of those that we take shares from aren't gonna you know we might get a hundred bucks at some point or another but there will be a few and this is the way an accelerator works is those few that really scale they may fund the entire organization and right. that's that's sort of the hope that's the way accelerators make their money that's the way ultimately we're hoping to do we're just expanding out yeah. bigger at the bottom end of the funnel or the top yeah. end of the funnel depending on which way you look at it right, right, uh right. at the top end of the funnel so that we we're developing the ideation in a way that people who don't even get into our funnel might still ultimately build a business. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally get it. Oh yeah. Well, let me just, I mean, let me applaud you. I, I, we've got to talk in three years or hopefully (laughs) way before that, but I just got to know, like, this is a great case study Mm because this you're, you nailed it and you're hundred percent right. We've got, and I use the word, we American Christians, Yes. We're, we're notorious of throwing money at stuff and then thinking that's it that's makes it. us feel good. And it's right. and I think, unfortunately, until you go on your side where you actually see it in action. Yeah. Once again, it's the bears. It's the bears out of state park. Right. If they know if we put food out near the trash cans, they're just going to come get the food. It's, right. it's, it's just the way it works. And it's, right. it's really true. I've seen it. Right. I, I've I've actually seen people like just ask for things that you would figure like why would you ask me for that it's because it's a mentality it's like it is i literally was i was i heard the other day a person asked for a motorcycle because they just knew i was an american and so they're right. like oh these americans just give out stuff so I, he asked me for a motorcycle i'm like what why would i give you a motorcycle right but it's, right. it's like it 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 shined a light on how they just it's an expectation Yes. That, um, the American Christians give you what you want and they're right. not even scared to ask. Right. And, and those bears too, you know, the bears get fat, they stop hunting, they stop the, you know, their claws get, get soft. And yep. then if suddenly you, you did all of a sudden lock up all the trash, what are they going to do? Yep. You know, they don't, they haven't hunted for years, you know, they yeah. haven't, they haven't actually had to do anything for themselves. Yeah. So it, it's, and again, it's not their fault nope. Nope. that we, we put out the food, we yep. help them, find that so and i mean the other uh, you know i don't know if you've ever read when helping hurts by corbin fickert but uh fantastic book there's a great story it's actually from rwanda of a two brothers who started an egg business and they got a bunch of chickens they started selling eggs they were successful they started buying more chickens they you know started a warehouse they started creating jobs and then a church in atlanta very well intentioned said, all oh, these poor people in Rwanda, they don't have enough proteins. Let's bring them eggs. So they flood the market with free eggs. And, and of course, the guys, yeah, the guys can't compete with free. Yeah. I mean, they're, they've got to make a living. So they've shut their business down. And a year later, the church says, oh, this has been so great. Let's go someplace else. And the community is left with no eggs and no egg business. Yeah. And it's worse off Try. than before the charity got there. So charity really does have a destructive power that can kill industry in a way that we've got to be very, very careful about the way we use it. Again, in relief and relief situations, totally makes sense. If there's right. an earthquake, we've got to get houses. We've got to get food. We've got to get things to them. But we can't maintain that indefinitely or else people will not be able to build it themselves. And we've got yeah. to give them the chance to do that. No, be- no beautiful. Thank you for saying that. 
you're hundred percent right. What you're doing is you're letting people who live somewhere, know the market, have a way better feel for what's going on than us. Cause one thing that drives me crazy about the American mission missionary journey is uh-huh. we, because we're not the Catholic church. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say the Catholic church has it right. I would just say they're better off than Protestants and the fact that they have a structure, uh-huh. right? Like they have a structure and things get passed up the buck and they know where everybody is and where their churches are. We have so many autonomous, denominational, independent, whatever, that like right now we have churches that are like, we're going to send some people to Rwanda to be missionaries. And right now there's five missionaries packing their bags, coming home because right. they can't find anybody to support them. And we're right, sending right. new ones. It's like, right. And so what happens is you have a culture of people coming and going and money and throwing money and throwing ideas. And to your yep. point, hey, let's give them eggs. Ah, we're not eggs. Ah, let's give them t-shirts. You know, right. you know it's whatever. And right. it, we have this chaos in our mission work because no one owns it. Right. And and we're all just throwing it. And what that does is it creates a mess on the other side yep. where these people are just getting money and they're like, oh, if you're going to give me money for t-shirts, then oh, okay, I love t-shirts. Oh, your eggs. Okay, no, I love eggs. Right. And they're just right. adapting to the money coming in. Yes. And they're not hungry to create their own companies anymore. Right. It's just, it's a, I don't think people understand that they're listening. They don't understand. It is a really bad mess in yes. Africa and some other, I mean, I don't know. Where Lots of other places. Cam- Cam- Cambodia is another spot, which has just okay. been inundated with charity. But it's the same. It's the same mentality. It's it's the same kind of issues. So it just yeah, you're absolutely right. It just it, it it's it's hard for people who you know who've been given charity for a long time mm-hmm. to really take a hard look at what they've what they've given to because it, it, again, I'm not. I don't want to fault anybody who gives away money. I know it's it, well intentioned. I know your heart. I know you're trying to do this. The question we really have to start asking ourselves is what's effective? What's mm-hmm. really going to help people develop and build stuff? Because those guys over there who have been taking the free T-shirts and the free eggs and all the T-shirt industry has been decimated. The egg industry has been decimated. We've been giving them all this free stuff. They don't like it. I mean, no. they're happy to have the eggs. They're happy to have the T-shirts. But they're sitting there going, man, we're just poor people. Mm-hmm. and that identity is not one that anybody wants to have yeah. we need to think of africa we've been the the charitable industry here has made the face of africa the starving child yeah. and we need to change the face of africa we need to, we need to put a face of africa up there that is the entrepreneur the guy that's out there who's got an idea and he's trying to build something and he yeah. wants to create something for his country and for his family and for his as for his employees you know that that guy there are there are there are these guys out there. If we can see that guy as the face of Africa, we're going to change the way that we give charity. Yeah, no, you're hundred percent right. I, I know there's some tension here somewhere. Cause I, do, I mean, the devil's always in the details, but I Absolutely. wish the first place that went over <laughs> to Africa and said, you know, we want to dig a well. It was like, okay, who owns a well company? Right. And, and then we'll, we'll pay you. Mm-hmm. So he has to then hire somebody and then he's the repair shop. Right. Like if, we, if we just would have come in with and asked differently, yep, it probably would have worked out better. But we came yep. in sort of arrogant of we know how to build wells, we'll build it for you. And then right, like you said, that doesn't work when it breaks. Right, right. There's not a well, there's not a well company in the whole village. Right, right. And it's and it's and it's hard again because again, for everybody who's out there who's been giving giving money to to charities and to other things. I know your heart. I mean, I really do. I, I, I understand that you want to do something good, but I was also a philosophy professor for a while. That's another one of my hats that I wear every now and then. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that I used to tell my students when I was teaching philosophy is, you know, the questions are way more important for the conversation than the answers. Mm-hmm. The, you know, having an answer shuts down the conversation. When we ask the question and we keep refining that answer and cre- keep finding new ways to do it, we're actually getting to better and better answers. But we got to yeah. keep with the question. And the question here is, how do we genuinely help? It's that same question those guys in Haiti asked me. So what are you going to do? Yeah. What are we really 
doing that's effective, that's really helping people. And I think that's what we got to keep asking over and over and over is what we did last time. Was that effective? Yeah. What can we do better next time? And how do we keep making it better? Yeah, I think your I think your model's wonderful. I can't wait for the for it to get dialed in and tweaked over time. I'll definitely be keeping my I would I would love to come back in five years and tell you about our all of the different locations we're hitting. I I I I wanna I want to see the model. Like I said, my main focus now is getting this one model up. Yeah. But as soon as it's up and we've got something that we can start, you know, uh systematizing replicating it's not just about getting to new places it's about getting that model replicatable Uh so that we can scale and we can keep moving that's what that's really what we want to build okay love it um just for the listeners here what's the two or three things that people can pray for and then what do you want them to do do they so just do they give do they support a particular entrepreneur like what how, how can people pray for you and how can people support you that's that's a those great questions i think praying for us uh, I think the one of the biggest things is praying that we really are open to the Lord and that we really are listening and that we're listening to the people that are over there and we're refining the model in a way that's really going to make it effective. I think that's a big part. The other thing right now is that, you know, we're still we're we're ready to go with this model, but we need to capitalize it. So obviously, I just appreciate your prayers for you know the the right people, the right investors, people that really believe in what we're doing, that that they could come along and, and do that. Um, I think the other thing that people can do is learn more. You know, I think I think if anything can happen out of this podcast, that that people, your listeners, could go out and think again about how they give away money. Don't stop being generous. Be generous. You've you've got it. that's part of the gospel. That's Second Corinthians eight. That's that's part of the gospel. You have to be generous. Uh, not just have to be like you know bad bad if you're not. Uh, but I mean, this is part of our calling. This is part of what God put in us is to be generous. But be generous in a way that genuinely impacts the places that you're being generous to in a way that's good. Yeah. And and I would just say, educate yourself. Read When Helping Hurts. That's a great book. Toxic Charity is another good one. Uh, that one sounds a little bit more negative, but it's, it but, it's <laughs> but but it's but it's uh, those are they're, they're easy reads, and they will they will change the way you think about giving. Um, and then, you know, go to our website. I think that okay. we've got a couple of really good things, uh, some videos on the missing middle that uh, that I think would be really helpful for people. But we just I just want to help people give differently in a way that's truly going to impact the people that we want to reach. Um, and and by the way, too, I realized we didn't even talk about the ministry aspect of this. Part of what we're trying to do with this is do this all through Christian leadership. So that Christians, the the believers in an environment can get out and have real influence in the marketplace for good, you know, in a way that the marketplace says, wow, those Christians, they're really doing something good for us. That's incredible. They're not just coming out and handing us a tract. They're helping to start businesses. That's amazing. Yeah. If we can raise that reputation of the believers in an area that that changes the way the gospel interacts with an environment. No, I love it. Yeah. So the so Christians aren't the people who just bring a bowl of rice. They're bringing, they're helping, they're investing into me. And that screams yes. something way better and way different. Okay. One last question. Sorry. You, okay. you, you, you said something <laughs> that ahead. made me wonder. When you have your criteria for a business, do, yep. they, do they have to be Christian to no. apply? Uh, to, to get into a cohort? Not yep. necessarily. And part of the reason is, and I know there's a lot of uh, companies out there that are doing this kind of Christian entrepreneurship that really only want to work with Christians. And I, and I understand the impetus there. I understand the idea that we want to build the Christian community up, but especially in some more hostile places or unreached areas, part of what I've seen over there is the Christians can tend to create this sort of little societal bubble where they've been self-protective. They're keeping themselves safe. Mm -hmm. And that even when they build a business, they really only ever serve the other Christians in that bubble. Right. And it doesn't, the Christians never wind up having an influence on the rest of society. And yeah. so part of what we're doing is saying, let's help all business people, but let's yeah. do it as Christians. Yeah. Let's do it from the motivation that comes from the gospel, but let's bring in the, the non-Christians and say, we want to help you guys. We want to have an influence for good for you. And when they finally, you know, ask, well, 
why are you loving us like this? That we've got an, we've got an answer for them, you know, yeah. and that we're incorporating faith in what we're doing, but we're doing it in a way that helps them regardless of whether they make that decision, because that's what we as Christians are called to do is to love the world. So let's right. love them in a way that actually impacts them yeah. for betterment of their lives great answer i was hoping that was the answer because what a great opportunity to be salt and light and then people like why would you help me it's like oh let me tell you about the love of my savior that what makes me love you and it opens that door in a way that if you just stay in the christian bubble that's not what we were called we were never exactly called to stay in there and only support christians we're called to be salt and light which means you have to be salt and light amen and so Amen. amen good for you brother i'm glad to hear that well, brother, thank you so much for taking the time. I will, we will re-interview for sure. Okay. And, and, I, yeah. I would, I would love that. I really would. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what God does in these next couple of years for sure. All right, brother. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Todd. Thank you for listening. Be sure to follow on TikTok or Instagram for daily stories Christians need to know. Wanting to increase the reach of your ministry or your church's ability to make disciples? Come to my website for free resources and webinars built exclusively for Christian nonprofits and churches. CreativeDigitalGuide.com helps executive directors and pastors learn how to gain ministry partners to do God-sized missions.